All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you're watching us around the world, because this is live streamed, hello to you, wherever you are. My name is Fadi Shehade. I am the president and CEO of ICANN. I am joined today by a fantastic group of people on stage. I think I don't need to make too many introductions, so we will keep this focused on uh, titles and names, because I'd like, as I'm sure you would, to get into a discussion very quickly. But let me first explain what we're going to do in the next hour. Next year, the internet digital economy will pass four trillion US dollars in the G20 economies. So here are the good news and the bad news. It's a huge digital economy, but it's mostly in the G20 countries. We are here to learn and to think together, how do we take this digital economy and make it for everyone, for all the people in the world, for every small business, as we are learning here in China, through the great success of Alibaba, but also small businesses in Namibia, small businesses in Vietnam, everywhere in the world need to benefit from this great new digital economy. The second thing I want to tell you as we start is that the digital economy or cyberspace is no longer a vertical sector. Most of us think of vertical sectors, automotive, health, digital economy. Yes, it is a four trillion dollar vertical, but the reality is that the internet changed all economy in fact, some people say cyberspace is dead because all space is now cyber. Everything. The automotive sector, the health sector, the education sector, every sector is now changed because of the internet. The internet is truly like a powerful river that has changed the land that we all know. But like any powerful river, it needs bridges and it needs dams and it needs tunnels, and it needs governance. Otherwise, the river is used only by a few or benefiting only a few. So how do we govern the internet? What are the dams and the bridges and the tunnels and the rules and the policies and the agreements that will manage this powerful river called the internet? This is the question of the day and I guarantee you this is the question of the century because the internet is changing our century. And we, the people, users, governments, businesses, civil society, technical people, all of us, this is what we call the multi-stakeholder community. We must discuss and agree how will we govern the internet. And now the question of this panel. How to govern this powerful internet, this powerful river, without restricting innovation? Is there a balance between resiliency of the internet and good governance of the internet and its openness and its availability as a place of permissionless innovation? How do you balance the two? The same question applies on privacy and security and so on and so forth. That balance is the question of the day. So, I'm going to pose this question. I will make a few comments, and then I want to engage our panelists and you in a real dialogue in the next hour about that. So I start with Professor Andrew Moore. Uh, Professor Moore is the head of the Computer Science Department at Carnegie Mellon University. Next to him is Commissioner Moedas, who is the European Commission's Commissioner for Research and Technology. Next to him is the Executive Chairwoman of the Mozilla Foundation. Mitchell Baker is one of the great thinkers of Silicon Valley, who leads a foundation that brings together the great technologies and values of the internet and we thank her for being with us here today. And of course, to my left, are you gonna challenge me now? Do you know who's to my left? 
To my left is someone that many of you know as the executive chairman of the Alibaba Group. But for those of you, like me, who had the privilege of a few private conversations with this man, you would know he is much, much more than that. He is a man who really believes in the internet as an empowering tool for the youth and the people around the world who need most help. And that's what makes Jack Ma a very special citizen of the world. And we thank him and the Alibaba Group and China for the great contributions he's made, and I think the great ones to come as someone who cares about the internet as a true power of changing the world to a better place for all of us to live, which is the motto of the World Economic Forum. So, let me put up a slide to start this dialogue. Let's see. Uh, if you could go to the previous page of that slide, please. There should be a uh, bigger picture of the three layers of governance. But let me, at a high level, tell you what I'm going to introduce here. To govern the internet, there are three layers. The bottom layer, the green layer that you see, and just focus on the three layers. You don't need the detail, but just to explain to you. The bottom layer is the network layer, the infrastructure layer of the internet. Who governs that? You know the internet has 70,000 networks today. Who governs these? Well, the standards of these networks are made by the IEEE, by the ITU, by the IETF, and the rules on governing this layer come from national regulators and telecommunications ministries. The question is, is the governance of this green infrastructure layer working? I would submit to you, yes. Largely, this is fine. Then we go to the next layer. This big yellow layer is the logical infrastructure of the internet. Because the internet is 70,000 networks. The way it looks like one internet for the world is because of this yellow layer. That layer is coordinated by my organization. We are responsible to make sure that the whole internet looks like one internet. Every one of you here I see has at least 17 phones and two computers and five iPads and all these things. And of course soon your shoes and your plants and your clothes, everything will talk to the internet. Every one of these things needs an IP number, right? That's what's managed in the yellow layer. One unique IP number for every one of the billions of devices that talk to the net. Who governs that layer? ICANN, the IETF, govern that layer. Is that layer well governed? Of course, I'm biased, I run ICANN, so I will tell you generally yes. We had an important event happen in that layer you should know about, is that ICANN and this layer have been controlled by a US government contract. And one of the important things happening in the world of internet governance today is that the US government has now formally agreed to end that unique role over the yellow layer. Hence, making the yellow layer an independently governed layer for the world. And China, Minister Liu Wei came to the ICANN meeting last June and affirmed China's commitment to stay within that layer. So did India, so did President Rousseff of Brazil. These are important events. Now you have global leaders accepting a single internet logical layer as opposed to a fragmented internet where we will have a Chinese internet or a BRICS internet and a European internet and an American internet. Not a good thing, I'm sure Jack would tell you this would not be good for business. It also would not be good for society. And now we come to this little blue layer which is where our discussion should be. And that's the economic and societal layer. This is where we now have the big question. Who decides what are the rules to manage the economies and societies that are moving to the digital platforms? Look at the fights that are going on now in the world about privacy versus cloud security versus child protection, security, warfare, human rights, trade rules, taxation, where will these rules be made? Should they be made at the United Nations? 
Should they be made by government? Should they be made by all of us? And if so, where? These are the questions of the day. The economic and societal layer of the internet today does not have a governance framework. And that's where the real questions are. So with this, I'm going to ask each of our panelists, and I'll start with Professor Moore from the end there, to give me their thoughts or to share with you their views as to how are we going to govern this important layer and what are going to be the platforms that ensure the continued openness of the internet. Professor Moore, I start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> these are really important questions and the importance of the questions are rising up your awesome but overly complicated PowerPoint chart. That is, that is, that is very important. So <clears throat> one thing that we all fear right now in the internet, I think, is the concept of walled gardens, the idea that there's, there turns out to be one place and one place only where you're allowed to go to get your information or to buy your services. And some people are frightened of that walled, government being some, walled garden being some government agency, the department of the internet. And I think many of us would not be excited if that was the direction that the internet is going to go. Some of us will be frightened about the idea that there's one super mega company, one large conglomeration, which uh, comes together and is the place which controls uh, where we can access. What we all really want is an open internet where the most useful and helpful services and products and information sources uh, can thrive. Before I was uh, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, I was one of the team responsible for the search engine of one of the large, uh, one of the world's large search engine companies, and this question kept on coming up, making sure that we could open up to the rest of the world the possible places to get their information from, to help the world understand which small company or which medium company or which large company can give them the best service. Here's where I see government being able to help at this blue level in a very significant fa fashion. It is really important for someone who's using the internet to be able to know whether they can trust a link that they're clicking on or they can trust an app that they download. The real question is who is going to help make sure that we users of the internet are safe when we move to somewhere run some service. Uh, one perfect example. If you at the moment ask a search engine a question about cancer or a serious disease, what does it mean if one of the answers is a suggestion that you should go to use magic crystals to help cure your cancer? Who should decide if that's okay or not? I don't think it's the search engine. I don't think uh, the government can really come down in every single case. I would like to really understand what we're going to do about that. So Commissioner Moedas, he just made a great point about trust and who should the consumers trust. So now we need frameworks for governing trust. Who will decide? Who will tell the consumer that this person trying to sell you X, Y, or Z to heal your cancer is telling you the truth or is lying to you? Do you think governments should be doing this as a commissioner in one of the largest markets in the world? most sophisticated markets in the world. Do you think your consumers expect the European Commission to regulate, for example, healthcare providers in the digital space? And how would you do that? Because that healthcare provider could be in Dalian, selling a solution to a citizen in Europe in Portugal. How are you going to regulate a Dalian-based healthcare business? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here, because it's uh, rare that I have this opportunity to be here with business people, and I'm a politician. But I'm a very humble politician, because when you look at uh, uh, the difference in between what you do and what I do, I think that what you do is much more important. And that makes me go to the point that one of the major difficulties we have today in terms of government in different countries is that the speed is totally different. So sometimes we're trying to regulate things that, one, or will not exist, will be very different from what we thought, mm. and will take us five years. Mm. And you're doing things every day. So 
how do we as governments or institutions can actually create regulation that is adaptable to the future and that is actually bottom up and not top down. I don't know if you know one of the most, um, probably one of the most interesting stories uh, in Europe uh, of how top down doesn't work. At some point, the two major leaders uh, of Europe at the time, uh, President Chirac uh, and Chancellor Schroeder, decided that um, Europe should have a competitor to Google. And uh, a project went actually forward. It was called Quaero. You still go and check the website. Um, and you know, absolutely amazing. Two leaders, uh, two big countries deciding actually to compete with two young guys from California, right? And so I, I'm a believer that it's not up to the government to uh, go on that kind of top-down approach. The government can help on setting the standards. We can actually listen from you, and then we can decide. Uh, but we cannot actually do it. We cannot build it. We can actually listen and then do it. So what we're doing now, it's a project called Beta Regulation, which is actually about how to create that new type of regulation, how regulation can be adaptable to the future. And I think that's a part of the answer of what we're talking here. The other part, I mean, we'll see. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mitchell, you come from uh, a part of the world, the Silicon Valley, where we believe all technology is good. Technology is perfect. It must be good. And we believe that. People in the valley build technology with a real sense that technology must be good. Well, so why was Uber banned from many cities in the world if technology is good? I think we are seeing now the beginning of an understanding that yes, technology may be intrinsically good, but technology has to fit into an ecosystem. And that ecosystem includes people, it includes regimes, it includes frameworks of governance. What is your view about this issue of governing the internet? Is this a paradox or an oxymoron? You cannot govern the internet. Is that the view of Silicon Valley and how could you help us understand that community? I start with the idea that technologists love technology and that it's always good. Actually, I think technology is often neutral. Human nature can be good and human nature can be really frightening. So to, to, just like we love innovation, we want innovation, but not all innovation is good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the case that if we don't have innovation, we have no hope of solving the problems facing us today. And so like innovation, we need technology, we need development, we need those changes. Uh, stopping, it, it, I'm not sure if it's possible, but, but, but certainly uh, the state of the world will not improve if we stop innovation or we stop technology. You know, so so that's, that's one piece. And the question is not just setting in context, but setting in human nature. Yeah. Uh, of, 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 and so there is a social component of what are we incented for? Mm. You know, what, what side of human nature does our society bring out? Uh, and, and the other piece is very often you, new technology, you know, innovation sounds great, but another word for innovation is disruption. Mm -hmm. and, and when a technology is really disruptive, there's somebody on the receiving end of that disruption who's uncomfortable. And so, yes, the complaint or the comment that technologists love technology is true. I, I think you have to have it in your blood. Like, it's, it, it, it's glamorous, but it's not easy to build a company and bring it to a global scale. And it's not that easy to solve a technological problem. You know, it has to really be in your blood and, and driving you. And so you see that, you know, more than the social context uh, sometimes. Uh, but, but we also see that when that technology comes to market, there are some issues about, is it good for society, mm -hmm. which we need to address. And there are other issues, which are, is it good for the existing business models? You know, and I think technologists are not very moved by that latter statement. No, Mitchell. But, but the former statement, yes. And I think the former statement, many technologists, certainly at Mozilla, every technology is interested in what is the nature of society and how are we improving it. Um, but, 
we need to separate it out from resistance because it affects a business model. Yeah, this is a, a point that I'm sure Jack would uh, agree with you on, that if we continually focus on what we sometimes call paving the cow path, because you know, when, when, when the Roman Empire uh, wanted to control large swaths of land, they figured out where the cow paths were and they paved them for exactly the width of Roman carts. Now, in technology changes that paradigm. We cannot be paving the cow path. We cannot be just simply thinking, how do we adapt government so, or how do we bend technology so it fits into a governmental model? Let's be frank. The internet was built by people who were intent on making sure the internet does not follow the Westphalian nation state lines. An IP number does not know if it's in Dalian or in Cairo. That's by design. So the internet is by design transnational. Now, which brings me to the key question. Most of the regimes that we use today to manage the world are international, not transnational. International means between nations. So a nation meets with another nation. They have a bilateral agreement. Or multiple nations meet and have a treaty. Well, the internet is not built around the nation state model. It does not understand law jurisdictions, right? Because as we discussed, you could have a healthcare provider in Dalian providing healthcare to someone in the European Union, and all your rules and regulations have zero effect on that. And how do you manage that? So this brings me to trade. Most of the global trade has been regulated through bilateral agreements and large treaties. May I remind you of Doha, or of the efforts that have been going on to create treaties on how people do trade with each other. Well, that international system, if I can be direct right now, is challenged by the internet. How does the WTO deal with the speed of the internet? What Alibaba has done with commerce in China and what I'm certain they will do with e-commerce around the planet changes the game. And what are the rules? How are we going to create these and who will create them? What do you think? Okay, thank you. Well, first I would like to make some comments about internet governance. Um, this world has close to 1.5 billion people who were born in the 1980s. In the next 30 years, we'll probably have more than 3 billion people born of the internet. These people born of the internet are so different from my grandmother, my age. They want to get involved. In. So internet is going to change the whole world in a tremendous way. It's going, to in, it's going to influence and change next 85 years. So we've got to be very careful about that. So I remember, I, I'm not the guy that good at governing, because I, I remember 1995, I was in 1996, I was invited to a, a internet meeting in Beijing about a group of experts gathering in a building from China, a lot of people, like, 20 people from different uh, organizations. They called themselves internet experts. And I said, what, 1996, we have a lot of internet experts <laughs> in China. And the topic is how to control and manage government internet. Well, the discussion go nowhere. Today, 20 years passed, all the things they worry about never happened. The things they did not worry about all come out. <laughs> so today, after 20 years, we all pretend we know a lot about internet. But compared to the future, we know so little about our future. We know so little about the internet. So I think governing the internet is important. We have to take good care of about the security, privacy, intellectual properties. But we should govern it in a new way, not in a traditional way. We should, in, we should govern the internet like a zoo. That means all kinds of animals. We should not govern the internet like a farm, same kind of animal. 
chicken and ducks all the same. So this is what I think. And we should not leave this job only to the government. We should, we should have multi-stakeholders. The government, business, and all kinds of organization that should join together. It's tough at the beginning, but it takes time. So as the guy that like working like me, as the business guy, we don't want the rules. But the government won't have the rules. But we know we need to have rules. If there's no rule on the internet, it's not going to help the internet. So by answering that, my point is that how can we respect internet, develop internet, improve the internet, and try to govern the internet in a new way? And how can we lead the internet to help more people? For example, Fadi just said, what I'm doing is I know internet have a lot of problems. How we can use the internet to create new opportunities for young people, mm -hmm. for the small business? Mm -hmm. We know that WTO was great in the past 20 years, but WTO was the organization governed by government. And I think all the government not always agree with each other. Mm -hmm. If the government do not agree with each other, the business people got puzzled. What are we going to do? Frozen. It's frozen. We don't know what to do. So the Doha meeting we've been discussing more than 10 years go nowhere because WTO was the treaty agreed by the government. So we should have, at the internet time, should have an EWTO, that it's, it's a treaty agreed by business people, supported by government, and that will probably do better. And I think the past 20 years, because the WTO, well, the globalization was for big companies, for big countries, next to 20 years, the internet, with the help of the internet, we should use the internet to help the small business, help the developing nations. This is what I call the EWTO. So where this is EWTO, what we should do, who should govern this, what's the framework, this is what you should think about. And by doing that, improve the trade, create the jobs, helping young people, then internet might be on the good way. This is my point. So, Commissioner Moedas, if you could comment on that. I think there was here a very practical suggestion. Uh, Jack called it EWTO. But I think what he was describing more than the name, and by the way, I hope somebody already reserved EWTO.org or .com. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. And if yeah. someone from my team is here, please reserve EZOO.com. <laughs> I like that too. But. Uh, Really, the question here to, that is being asked, what will be these mechanisms? And who will come up with them to actually create trade rules that move at the speed of the internet? And by the way, it's not just about trade. The same question applies to crime, yeah. right? I met the president of a pretty uh, uh, important country in the area of terrorism who, when he met me, he gave me a list of 1,300 internet sites. He says, all these sites are inciting our children to join terrorist organizations. And he said, aren't you the one responsible for all the websites in the world? Close them. <laughs> that would be in the public benefit. And I looked at the president and I told him, it's not that simple. You know, yes, of course we can close them, but under what rule? What will be the rule for me to decide this is a site that's bad for those children versus these children? And after I discussed it with him a little bit, he became even more angry because, not at me, but at the realization that as the president of a country who knows these sites are inciting children in his country to become terrorists, he has no power. And my fear is that if we continue without mechanisms to address these issues, then you'll have decisions like the one made by Turkey not too long ago to shut down YouTube because a couple of videos were against their laws. I don't think this is healthy and it will make governments react in ways that are disproportionate to the issue. So what do you think about that? As someone sitting, frankly, even though you, you termed yourself a, a humble politician, which and we thank you for that. By the way, we need more of you. But truly, how 
Do politicians actually have a positive role in solving this important conundrum that Jack described? I think Jack said it all, uh, that it really is a multi-stakeholder approach. And you know, one of the things that is really, if you look at uh, the history of economics uh, in Europe, and you see how Europe was open before the First World War, uh, where you would trade all over uh, with no boundaries and barriers, and then what the First World War actually brought, a fear uh, and intolerance, and the Second World War came. And so I think that really what makes me and concerns me is that we are all here in summer Davos, and uh, the ones that are here are a privileged few, but a lot of the others that are outside need, to, need actually to have your message uh, in a much more vocal way. Yes. Because what we are seeing in the world outside of here is that people are getting more protectionist, more closed, because they think that will protect them. And that will not protect them. That will be worse. But for that, politicians need uh, people like you to be more vocal on the importance of actually creating those solutions with multi-stakeholders that are open. And uh, in my um, strategy for the future in research, science, and innovation, I called it the three O's, like the O's that we have here in the World Economic Forum. Open innovation, open science, and open to the world. And people told me, oh, but I mean, we know that. And I said, no, I have to repeat that, because a lot of people don't believe it. So it's politicians also need the help of people like you actually to be able and have the courage to change things and then to sit down and do the real change. Uh, but we need you to, uh, to be more vocal, that's, that's for sure. Okay, we need more uh, politicians asking business people to be engaged. And it's true because it's actually the common interest of governments and businesses and civil society and educators and technical people for us to find mechanisms that serve the public. All of us win when that happens. But I want to ask you, uh, Professor Moore, since you did work in Silicon Valley, many people worry that if governments do not bridle Silicon Valley and the big, large companies in Silicon Valley, that Silicon Valley itself will become kind of a shadow government of what happens on the internet. Uh, is that a good thing? Is that a possible thing? Could we see big uh, companies in the digital space control the digital space? And should governments do something about that? Or should uh, we let the space itself uh, find how to reduce the power of certain companies? Great question. First, I was not in Silicon Valley. I was in <laughs> Pittsburgh, where, where in the they, heart of the industrial the, American, the, and now the heart of artificial intelligence is uh, is, take, is taking hold. So anyway, <clears throat> the the interesting thing is, it is absolutely not useful for any hypothetical evil Silicon Valley schema to have an untamed crazy internet. If it was a zoo where all the cages were open, no one would go in. The last thing that Amazon or Google or Microsoft want is for people to be too frightened to go to the internet for services. So everyone wants it to be a safe place. The question is, how can we do it? I don't have a full answer to this, but there's one thing which I think is really in our favor and actually helps us right now to uh, make things better and safer, and that is data. I'm a technologist, I'm a statistician, I believe in data. Data is the one thing which actually can give us some objective information about what's safe and what's good and what's unsafe and what's not good. I'll give you a group, an, an example here. For many people going onto the internet, they're having, they want to do something. They want to help with the disease management. They want to buy a really cool new toy for their kid. Uh, they want to solve a problem. But they also need help that they need to know who to go to to help solve that problem. We all want them to be able to go to small startups. We want them to be able to go to local uh, businesses in developing countries, not just to McDonald's. How can we help them choose? I don't believe that we're going to get governments or even uh, well-meaning large Silicon Valley companies to decide uh, for them who's safe and who's not safe. 
data can help us. I'll give, here's one example. If you look at reviews of internet businesses, Alibaba being one awesome internet businesses, but there are hundreds of thousands of others, and how good a customer service they do if you buy something for them and you want it delivered to your house. Those reviews are a one attempt to help people understand, I should buy from this store because it will get me my camera when it tells it will. I should not buy from this store because the reviewers say it's terrible. Here's the interesting thing about this kind of example where people are trying to choose between which business to go for. The reviews they find online are almost completely uncorrelated with how good a service that they're going to get. It turns out that some of the most highly reviewed companies give a lousy service and vice versa. <laughs> the place that they cannot hide from, scru from, from scrutiny is the actual data. When third parties, and these could be governments and they can be uh, other companies, actually measure how accurately and quickly the goods arrive at the users, you get objective information. You don't need anyone to uh, come up with some subjective guess or to litigate the guess as to who should win on the internet. You can base it on data. Throughout healthcare, commerce, and other, other areas of the economy, uh, the place, given that this is such a hard problem, one of the places that I would place a bet for helping us is data. Gather data, make it transparent who's doing a good job, who's doing a lousy job, and who's intentionally doing a bad job. And of course, once you make data the crux of this, you need to help people know which data to trust, right? Which becomes yes. a different issue, and who would yes. do that? Who would be the trust uh, factor around data? I'm going to ask one last question of Mitchell Baker, and then I'm going to ask you to join us in the dialogue. So prepare your questions, and as soon as we see hands up, the forum staff is ready so we can direct questions, and you may address your questions to all of us or to one of us, um, and uh, w we look forward to that. So prepare your questions. Mitchell, I want to just switch slightly, but stay focused on governance and ask you an important question about governance. One of the big issues we're seeing around the world is the issue of local versus global. So in Silicon Valley, you have local values, local culture, that may be even different from Los Angeles, certainly different from Alabama. How about compared to Dalian, or to Beirut, or to Sydney? We have different values and different cultures. The internet is an infrastructure that does not see the local. It does not understand. It is transnational, as we said. So should there be rules that would allow societies, countries, regions, ethnic groups to protect their values on the internet, or should the internet actually be, uh, or end up being, what erases all these differences between us? So the fight between uniting and separating, and I know you have a set of values that are very rooted in what the internet is, openness, transparency, uh, which may not be every people's values. So how do we do that? Well, there's a lot in there. Let's see if I can, if I can get started. I, I would start at the core layer, which is the nature of the infrastructure itself. Yes. So your bottom layers, before we get to the blue layer, and say fundamentally that that system, well, every place where you decide my local, some local circumstances such that I don't want to see information from a global setting, I don't want to participate in it. That is a limiting of opportunity. It will be a limiting of economic opportunity. It will be a limiting of opportunity for understanding. And it will be a limit of opportunity on participating. Now, s many uh, governments, at least, uh, you know, are making that choice today. That it, in order to protect culture or sometimes themselves, uh, that they're going to limit that opportunity. So, at heart, you know, governments protect their people. Yep. A and so I think separate from whether I or somebody else thinks that's how much they should do that, that, that will happen. Um, this question of how much opportunity do you limit and why, I, I think we will see the consequences of it. 
Very few economies can afford to limit opportunity now. There are a few in the world that are big enough to be able to limit opportunity some, yeah. but, but not very much. And so uh, each time a society makes the decision that local is important, it's important enough to exclude others, right? You, you will limit opportunity in, in some way. Sometimes economic, sometimes social. Um, and the other question that comes up is, is, the, is it a protection of cultural social values or is it a protection of some part of the, the power structure? Because that will be an ongoing fight. If it is a, a, a sort of a ground up, um, bottoms up sense, this is my culture, I don't want these things here, and that we as a society want or are willing to limit the opportunities because this part of our culture is so important, then that, that mechanism has a sustaining ability of its own. If that is a part of a, a, a part of that culture that happens to have the ability to limit opportunity to protect itself, then you're protecting part of the culture and limiting opportunity for everyone, and that is a much less stable system over time. Yeah, I think, you see, this is bringing the whole question of identity to the fore. What is our identity? You know, I happen to have been born from Egyptian parents, grew up in Lebanon and Switzerland and the U.S., and I struggle myself personally. What is my identity? Who am I really? And now our kids on the internet, they go on the internet. Sometimes they build groups, they join groups that have people that cross national lines, ethnic lines, all kinds of lines. And they, are, they have an identity with them that has nothing to do with the passport they hold or with the color they have or with the church or mosque or uh, a temple they go to on, on the weekend. And so identity is also reshaped by the internet and many governments or societies are worried about the erasing of their identity through the internet. And therefore the question also becomes what rules will start coming down to limit that and what do they take away from our kids and the next generation? Big questions. Right, and how stable is identity? So limiting opportunity perhaps for the websites that are recruiting children into terrorism. A lot of, a lot of societies might do that. How carefully do you do that? How broad a stroke? Right. How, broad, you know, what, how broad a law do you have to stop that problem? These are such critical questions that the, that's why the multi-stakeholder system is so important here. Like Indeed. we've seen this in the United States with the surveillance of the US government, right? Which was made by law enforcement without the kind of public discussion that would be necessary because law enforcement's job is law enforcement. So, so they're doing their best there, but, but it's only now that we know about it that we can, as, uh, as Mozilla has been very active in, demand discussion with and of our government about that is not the system that we the citizens want. And so getting not just citizens who are outraged at their government, but also businesses and other communities into these difficult decisions earlier is part of the new governance system that we have to have. Yeah. Because what do all those young people look for? It's, you know, often it's a social network, often it's their friends, often it's an algorithmic response. And so what people trust and how you figure out what your society is going to do has to have a broad participation. Jack, yeah. you want to yeah. ask? I, th I think this is an interesting question. What I feel is that when, we, when the government and the people worry about um, you know, our kids losing their value, their culture. But on the other side, internet is building a global value for our next generation. Without the internet, people read by the newspaper, listen to the radio, by the TVs that their government arranged, mm. or their people arranged, their food sometimes. But the, on the internet, the next generation, they understand what is the global value. This is not the China value, the American value, it's the global value of our human. How you put to your value inside, melting together, building up the global value for our young generation of the future. Mm -hmm. Value is not, the cultural value is not actually created by the government, or by, it's created by your family, it's by your temple, your church, your everyday life behavior. So if you really think that is good, this will be there. 
Value and culture is your DNA. It's difficult to eliminate. But internet is going to be something that we can create a new thing. For example, any disaster comes, anything that bad happens, the world, our next generation on the internet, they're working together. Governing internet to, I agree with Mitchell said, governing internet is trying to governing the human nature today. Yeah. It is not easy. Mm. We've been trying to govern for 2,000 years, mm -hmm. want to work, but internet might help create something interesting new for the future. In the next 50, 100 years, we might have our kids share the same global value, mm. global culture. Meanwhile, because of their family, their temple, their church, they keep their DNA. This is what I think. This is very hopeful in a way, what Jack just said, because- I'm positive all the time. No, I, 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 know, I noticed that, I noticed that. But, but what you said is very hopeful because you said we can actually have global values that do not have to erase local values, that these two can coexist, but that those global values are to be discovered. In other words, yep. we still don't know what this will be. The internet is just starting. Billions of people are coming on it. We haven't heard from them yet. What will be that set of values? First hand up, this gentleman <laughs> there, if you could, we could get him a, he was very fast. He deserves <laughs> the first microphone. Please uh, tell us your name and uh, address your question either so to the panel. So, Li Wei from Tai uh, A question for both uh, Commissioner Moedas and uh, Jack Ma. Uh, Commissioner Moedas uh, mentioned uh, if there were a European Google, um, I'm just wondering how would the European uh, government or European Commission be independent on uh, regulating this market if there were such a company or say for Airbus. And for Jack Ma, um, Alibaba has become the national champion of China in a way. How do you kind of uh, utilize this position while not hurting competition, either from domestic or foreign? How do you handle this uh, relationship with the government? Thank you. Thank you sorry, much. how do we what? Excuse me, I did not get. How do you handle this relationship with the government in a way not hurting the interest of the entire society or other com companies? Okay. Thanks. Do you want to go first, Jack? Yeah. Okay, please. No, thank you very much for the, the question. Um, first, my point is exactly that it's not up to governments to, to do that. And I think what uh, politicians really do well and should do well is to lower the barriers for people to uh, create companies and have ideas and uh, do things that otherwise they wouldn't. You know, our biggest program for research and science is called the European Research Council. And the only thing we do is that we give grants of two and a half million to three million euros and we ask scientists, look, tell us what you want to do. We don't give them any guidance. And you know, it's the most successful ever program that we had. I mean, the inventor of graphene, uh, Professor Andre Geim, was part of it. The last year's Nobel Prize for Medicine was part of it. And so I think that's the role of government, is to lower the barriers and let people do and put the money on a bottom-up approach. Uh, and if you do that, you have amazing stories. And, and it's not just the government, it's the internet. When Jack uh, and Mitchell were talking, I was thinking about um, a kid in the Netherlands uh, that just came up to me, the story, a guy called Boyan Slat, that with 15 years old, he went to Greece and he found that there was a lot of plastic bags in the ocean. And so he came back and with 16 years old, he set up basically a crowdfunding in the internet. He solved and created a technological solution that is working today, and he raised $2 million. I mean, and that's the values that I think, Jack, you, you were certainly saying. I mean, you create these networks of values, of positive values. Of course, there's all the other counterexamples, and that's the, the difficult yeah. balance, but uh, there's really, I have hope that uh, the good examples will be much, uh, much more than the, the bad ones. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I think, you know, you say Alibaba is already a champion in China market. I, well, no internet company can be a champion for continue for five years. It's, diff, it's a tough business. It's a tough area because we have so many smart people, right? Good thing is we have so many smart people. Bad thing we have too many, so many smart people competing with you. <laughs> 
but we are still a baby. Compared, you know, with just 15 years, very few companies in China can survive for 30 years. We want to be a company 102 years, so we have a long way to go. But working with the government is an art, and it's also in a science. You have to respect, because government wants to protect the people. You have to respect that they've been governing in that way for so many years, and you want them to change. It's not easy. So respect them, talk to them, listen to them, and also let them listen to our problem, our fear, our worry. So it's about multi-stakeholder multi means let's sit down, respect each other, and we both have the future. So what Alibaba tries to do is that we want to make sure internet is the positive power, positive energy and resources of the innovation for the future. It's difficult for, today we know the business is not easy. We know the world is not good today. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult to go back to yesterday. Even if you want to go back to yesterday, you will not like it. <laughs> so let's see what's going on in the future. What's the future look like? I think the government and us, if we talk about the future, we can sit down together and talk. If we talk about tomorrow, yesterday, it will be, diff it will be tough. Yes. So as always, working with different people. And um, sometimes, if you're unlucky, well, we have unlucky things happening every day. So I get used to that. <laughs> It's difficult to hear Jack Ma speaking about unlucky things. <laughs> uh, he, is, uh, he's, he brings luck to many of us, and he's got uh, himself quite a bit of it. But uh, we're going to take two more questions. Uh, the gentleman here in the front, and I'll take the lady in the back. So if you, we could give her a microphone as well. You go first, sir. Hello, my name is Eric. Uh, we are the innovation pioneer this year. And uh, our technology is using uh, transgenic fish. Okay. I met him on the electric cart between buildings, and even on the electric cart, he was telling me what he does. So uh, yeah. I, so, I was uh, very impressed by your... The, the fish will become fluorescent when it detects toxin. And the breakthrough is that compared to the traditional testing method, which can test only 5 to 10, we can screen thousands at one time. So my question is to Mr. Jack Ma. And we learned that uh, Alibaba's vision is to help uh, the SMEs and make sure there's no difficult business. In the past um, decade, you helped millions of traditional SMEs. And now we are the new generation with the new innovation here. But we have the difficulty to promote this technology to the uh, enterprises, to the government, because they want to face, to realize that their, problem, uh, their product are not as safe as they think, yeah. because we test more. So how the internet or an uh, internet company like Alibaba can help this innovative startup to promote the technology and to benefit the society. Thank you very much. Well, first you're good salespeople. <laughs> you got a good chance to talk about um, your idea, and I, I, I think you will, if you continue to do that, you will be successful. And the second is that we had the same problem in the past 15 years, and at least 12 years, nobody listened to my story. Even to today, I came here talking to Davos, and I talked to a lot of investors. They still do not uh, believe what I'm talking about. They sell my stocks. Well, you know, life is that. Get used to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we are not going to help you. Nobody is going to help you if you don't help yourself. This word, don't trust that anybody is going to help you by heart. Only your wife, your parents, your kids. Maybe, and maybe not. Only you have to help yourself. And you make sure that you help your team. You team and you together help your customers. The luck is from your customer, not from company like Alibaba. Because Alibaba try to help, but Alibaba cannot solve any problems. And Alibaba itself may have a lot of problems. We need a lot of help, you know? That's the, that's the life. You just got free consultation uh, for your business. You know, that would have cost you dearly in any other setting. So, Jack, Jack Ma, straight, straight to you with good, uh, good ideas on how to... And, and he is, he's good. He's good, yeah. He's, you know, make the chance. He, he didn't know me. He saw me on a cart and he started telling me about what they built. So keep doing what you did. <laughs> Young lady there. 
Yes. Hi, I'm Sharon from the Sina Finance, and I have a question for uh, for the Jack Ma. Uh, how do you evaluate what's a uh, what's a relationship between the uh, government business and uh, maybe the EWTO you mentioned before, and especially is there any difference between the traditional and now, especially in China? Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Well. I've been thinking that for two years, how we can build up a network for the uh, small business, take advantage of globalization. Because I think past 20 years, I don't mean bad, it's called Americanization, right? They big company, multinational, go anywhere. Which the world benefited a lot in the past 20 years. But think about, think about the next two, because 80% of the business in the, maybe more than 90% of the business in this world are small business. They did not benefit a lot from the globalization. But today with the internet, we can. And I told the China government, if I a lot of government, we helped, like we got more than 400 million consumers and 10 million, you know, tens of millions of small business in China. If we can help them, why we cannot have globally? Why we cannot have Egypt? Why we cannot help the Philippines, Norway, Argentina? But it's not easy. I've been talking to a lot of government, uh, local, you know, governments in different countries. I have the same problem, just like I talked to my venture capitalist 15 years ago. We want to build up an e-commerce. They say, forget it. And we talked to a lot of governments. They say, hmm, interesting. Give me a proposal. When you give the proposal, go nowhere. It's okay. It takes time. I have a patience like this young man. And I think my proposal is simple. If we can make any small business sell across the board, less than, if the business is less than one million US dollars, we should give them duty tax free for importing. In this way, we can create millions of jobs for small business. But my idea have a lot. It's not a good time to talk about it here because of the time limit, but I will keep on fighting for that. Because this is, I'm not in, I'm, I was trained to be a teacher. I call myself chief education officer. And I want to fight for another 10 years for those small business. May work, may not work, but somebody has to fight. And I will be that person. Thank, Thank you. you, Jack. Let's bring this home so we can close this discussion today. Where we started was in saying that we need a new regime of global governance for the economic and societal layers of the internet that the layers of the internet that are technical are pretty much well managed today. The next challenge for the world is how do we put rules around governing the economic and societal layer. I think what we heard today, few key ideas. Everyone almost here said multi-stakeholder. So principle number one, that we cannot have governments alone or businesses alone or civil society alone make the rules for how the internet will work. We need to come together in new platforms that are necessary for all the stakeholders to participate in their own respective roles so that we can set the rules of the future. The second idea I heard today that I really liked is that we need innovation in governance, not just in technology. Most of us think of innovation around technology, mm -hmm. but we need new ways to govern. Because as the commissioner was saying, if we simply use the old methods, they cannot keep up with the internet. If we say, let me give you an example. If we tell companies who feel their copyrights are being violated on the internet, yeah, why don't we go and have a treaty about that? Typical treaties take seven to 12 years. Do you think we can tell people to wait seven to 12 years to solve an issue that is a problem today on the internet? Impossible. So we have an issue that governance need to be itself a space for innovation. Governments, businesses, all the stakeholders need to find new ways to govern. And when Jack says EWTO, or the idea of a trade organization that can move at the speed of the internet, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. And that is antithetical to the current governance models. So how do we get into innovation in governance? That's the second thing I took, and I'll ask you to add to these. The third thing I took 
and I really like that point, that globalization to date has worked for multinationals. It worked for big companies who know how to function across borders, who know how to function with governments, who know how to build big solutions across the world. Globalization today has not yet worked or benefited directly small businesses. And I think this is a new powerful concept that Jack is putting on the table, that we need to innovate to help those people, a small business anywhere in the world, to become a global business and allow them to do that. The trade rules around that for that small business around the world are today the same for a multinational. It doesn't work. We need to fix that. I think that's a key takeaway from you. So before I close this and remind people what great things the forum is doing in Davos, uh, and I hope we see many of you there, let me just go quickly back to my panelists and ask if they can, in 30 seconds to a minute, give some final thoughts or if they learned something new today. Professor Moore. I thought this was very good and I agree with your summary. I think that it's very important to understand that the only way to help small businesses is for, the, for some organizations to protect consumers on the internet. If the internet is too dangerous for you to be able to trust small businesses, then only the multinationals with their strong branding will be the ones that people pay attention to. So policing the internet to make sure that the businesses are evaluated to whether they're do, doing their services or not is necessary for the success of the small businesses. This is a powerful idea, actually, that you said a couple of times. I should yes. have put it in my summary. That one way to enable small business is to actually increase the trust factor of doing business on the net. Because I usually will go to a big company simply because I know they have a brand and I can trust them. Yeah. So if we can find a way to increase the trust on the net, then more small businesses can participate in that. Thank you. This is a, a good point. Uh, and please, Commissioner Moedas. Thank you very much. I, I, I thought I would just finish with a, with a story. You know, in March 1989, uh, in the CERN, in Switzerland, Tim Berners-Lee uh, wrote a memo to his boss. And when he wrote the memo to actually create a new uh, way, a new distributed information system, he uh, got back an answer from his boss. And his boss wrote on the cover, something that was quite, uh, for me, a message for the future. He wrote, vague but exciting. And with these words, <laughs> the world changed. So I think that the future is vague, is uncertain, but it's very exciting. So thank you very much for that. Well said, well said. Vague and exciting. That's the World Wide Web. OK. Please, Mitchell. When we think about internet governance, we should remember the percentage of the population that's under 15 or 20, and that the governance models that we have today are not trusted, many are not trustworthy, and involving the new kinds of participation and information flow in the new governance mechanisms we develop will be key to making them accepted. Involving the youth. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, the world has moving from IT technology to data technology time. Many things we worry today may not happen 10 years later. Many things we don't worry about may come. So I think the next 30 years will be the great time for women, for young people, and for small business. And this is what I believe. Thank you, Jack. Thank you all of you for your contributions. I believe the 21st century needs a new regime for digital governance. It is incumbent upon us to actually define this regime and ensure the internet continues to be the engine of growth it has been. And in this regard, the World Economic Forum has launched the initiative on the future of the internet. This is a very important initiative. And we thank, frankly, the Forum for their leadership, for their vision on this initiative. 
This initiative will start addressing many of these questions, and in Davos there will be a series of meetings to address how this internet can continue to be resilient and grow, but with enough rules, enough rules, so that this river can continue serving all of us. We do need some rules. It cannot be without uh, dams and bridges and tunnels, as we said, so that this river can benefit everyone. So thank you again. Have a wonderful stay in Dal Dalian.